805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits. So get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Eric Tolkien, and Eric is CEO of the Food Bank of Santa Barbara County. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much for inviting me, Cinder. Oh, golly, you have such a big story to tell. You, you are serving so many organizations and people, and it feels like you are doing so much. And so I hardly know where to start. Where, where shall we start? Well, I think the Food Bank, as you say, is definitely an organization that connects with so many other organizations as well as people in the town. And food is really you know, a basic thing that we can use as a building block to start giving people other types of help and giving people long-term solutions to uh, nutritional or health problems. So that's really why the food bank is there now. Emergency food is something that we provide for people who need it, but for us that's really the beginning of a relationship that we hope ends with people uh, working with their communities to be much healthier. Okay, so let's talk about that, being more healthy. Um, I know that you also have a focus on nutrition education, and so maybe you can talk about that, how, sure. how you're lifting people up sure. to a new reality. Well, I've been doing this job for 15 years now. When I first started, the food bank was giving out candy and soda to people, and you know whatever was given to the food bank, or the food bank could get, it would give out without any consideration to what are the health impacts of doing that. Uh, we live in a more enlightened time, hopefully, a few years later, uh, and we realize that the danger and the damage we can do to people, especially those who are food insecure, and their health may be more compromised than other people's health. Um, so we very quickly uh, acted to get rid of the candy and soda. We don't give out things like that anymore. And to really focus on fresh produce. I mean, we're lucky. We live in Santa Barbara County. This is in the top 1% of agricultural producing counties in America. So we have it here. We just need to be able to teach people to how to use it and to want to use it, you know, which are two really important things. And to be able to do that, you have to start when kids are in preschool and work up from there. Oh, so you go into the schools, do you? We do. We work with schools. We work in the after-school space as well. Uh, and we're, you know, we're even there with uh, now we, we have a program called Little Sprouts, which is kind of like three and four-year-olds. So you're oh never too young to think about what you're about to put into your mouth and whether it's going to be good for you or not. So, okay, how do you... How do you give that message to a three or four year old? Well, the first thing is that, you know, we can't give messages, right? If you, the, the old Hollywood producer said, you know, if you want to send a message in your movie, then, you know, get Western Union, don't put it in the movie. <laughs> and so we concentrate on, um, you know, interactive education mm -hmm. and learning by doing. So food, you know, that's something that you can easily learn by doing. So we engage kids in making meals, making very simple things, uh, experiencing it uh, rather than just, you know, here is, a, you know, a food pyramid or a my plate. <laughs> um, this is what you should be having, these chemicals you need to have. So just going away from that and saying, you know, food is an amazing thing that brings us together, it keeps us healthy. Let's learn how we can, you know, use food to keep ourselves healthy. So we have a series of programs that starts at that very young age. We have a program called FLIP, which stands for Food Literacy in Preschool. So we have, all our programs are run by volunteers, so that enables us to scale up these programs dramatically across the county. Wow. So we have a volunteer, we'll go into a preschool, each session they will teach about one particular produce item. They bring that produce item in, the kids get to bring home a bag to their families, but then they learn how to make something simple with it, they have games around it, a song, and so it's just really introducing them uh, to healthy food at an age that they're open. Um, you know, I'm, do you have grandkids? Yes, I do. Um, so we, we know that kids are very open to eating things mm -hmm. until about they leave preschool. And after that, they know they want sweet and they want salty and forget about everything else. <laughs> so if we can get in there and get kids connected to food, um, kids will eat something that they make. If you give them some broccoli in a way to do something with it, if they've done it, they'll eat it. Um, and so that's a really an amazing way to get kids engaged. And so our programming continues right up through grade school and to high school. We have a program called Teens Love Cooking, 
where we bring teenagers in. Uh, it's kind of like a, a nine week course once a week. Um, so we, we trust these teenagers with real knives. We give them knives um, and you know, teach them how to cook basically. And then at the end, they have a fiesta where they cook a wonderful meal and they invite their families in to see you know, what they can do now. Um, and this type of education is, is lifelong, right? We forget. Uh, we forget the things that we should be doing. So we do a lot of family-based education. And then we do older adult, adult nutrition education now as well, um, which primarily, again, just like with the little kids, is about cooking together, getting mm. people out, getting them connected, and then seeding in some of the kind of health aspects um, you know, that are relevant to somebody of that age. So it's an exciting thing to be involved with. Um, if we're having a conversation about our health and how we can all be healthy, that's not a disempowering conversation. If it's just we are a charitable food organization, stand in this line, feel bad <laughs> about standing in line, yeah. um, it just changes that dynamic and it makes people more open to considering their own nutritional journey. Wow. So, all right, so back when you were given, when the food bank was giving out candy and soda. Yes. And then now you're transformed. How did you figure out to do a different mm, way? Well, I mean, we were lucky, as I say, that we're in Santa Barbara County. You know, if we were in North Dakota and it was the middle of winter, you know, our options would be much more limited. So we do promote, um, you know, frozen vegetables are just as good as, as fresh vegetables, but we have so much here yeah. that it's an amazing opportunity. So the food bank um, partners with other food banks around the whole of California. Uh, we have a program called uh, Farm to Family, mm -hmm. where we get together, we hire produce solicitors who go out to the farmers. Uh, we buy all of what are called the seconds. So those are the less beautiful uh, mm -hmm. vegetables. And in California, you know, all the vegetables are very beautiful. So, um, you know, you, it's just strawberries that are not this big or, um, so th the, the seconds are amazing, the quality yeah. of them. So we buy them for pennies on the dollar, refrigerated trucks bring them to all the food banks. And so we are able to have a whole range of fruits and vegetables that we could not get in this county. Because if we just relied on what we had here, you know, we have our broccoli, we have our lettuce, we have our strawberries, you know, they're wonderful, but it could get pretty tired of them. So we're able to connect with um, apple growing places, mm. you know, places like Bakersfield that have a lot of stone fruit. So That's we're right. able to, to really have a, a healthy mixture of fresh produce. So just having that as the raw materials to work with makes a huge difference. So you work with all these other food banks around California. And then in Santa Barbara County, you work with all kinds of organizations that then provide food right. to families. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, all of us are only as good as our network, right? The other people that we work with to multiply the effect of what we do. Mm -hmm. So the food bank is lucky in the way that it operates is, so we have about 200 member agency programs um, within the community um, of both, you know, throughout the whole of the county. Um, and so we really do cover every community within the county, places like Guadalupe, uh, Nukiyama that are very isolated. Mm -hmm. um, so these um, partner agencies, as we call them, could range from things like um, you know, a daycare center through to uh, you know, a long-term care facility, um, places that are providing for um, people who are homeless, a whole range of different organizations. So they come to us every day to our warehouses in the north and the south county and they pick up food which they then use in their programs or distribute. Wow. So if an organization is not involved with you now and they're interested in it, they could go on your website and figure out how to do that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're always looking, you know, who we can work with. We look at the geographical situation. You know, are there a lot of food distributions in that area already? Or is this a client group that's not being adequately served? Um, so yeah, and we love to partner with other organizations in terms of our educational programs. So we work with a lot of uh, medical organizations within mm. the county um, and a whole range of other organizations that provide expertise. Gosh, now do you have a sense Okay, so there's food banks all over the place. Do you have a sense of how unique our food bank is as compared to others 
in, in other counties or we, other areas. We are very special here, That's Cinder. the feeling <laughs> that I have That had. is what, the, what I'm convinced of anyway. But, uh, I mean, we were certainly very early uh, adapters of this idea of a nutritional focus and yeah. of empowering people that we're working with rather than just focusing purely on um, what is called feeding the line. So uh -huh. just feeding a line of people yeah. who show up. Um, so that has really, you know, encouraged us to think differently. You know, our slogan has always been hunger into health. So this idea of if you're hungry, I'm not just going to fill your be mm -hmm. belly with whatever uh, calories are there, and, you know, because there are good calories and bad calories. Um, we want to move people to a place of health and, and independence. From hunger to health. That's right. So it, it involves something called food literacy. Oh, mm -hmm. So you know, you know that in life, if you are illiterate or enumerate, you go through life with one hand tied behind your back, right? And so food uh, illiteracy is just the same thing. If you don't know how to be healthy with food, mm -hmm. then you are kind of um, beholden to processed foods and fast food places for your whole life. And that creates a huge health impact on you. So the idea of food literacy is that we teach people the basic skills in terms of, you know, how do I plan a budget for my food mm -hmm. for this week? How do I go and uh, plan the meals? How do I go out and shop in a way that's as cheap as possible? How do I cook in a way that is a real world way of cooking? Like I've mm -hmm. got, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. What can I do that's simple? Mm -hmm. And then how do I store my leftovers so that I can use them for other meals. Mm -hmm. So we found that these skills really help people when they are food insecure in that, you know, if people are often food insecure at later on in the month, they paid all their bills, their rent, and they have very little money left for food. And so often they buy junky food, which makes them less healthy, less yeah. able to work. So it creates a vicious cycle. Um, so we go in there and give them these skills and then if they you know, are able to freeze food that they've made earlier in mm -hmm. the month, they can stretch things out and still be healthy. So the skills are very important. The food is really just part of it. So when you use the term food insecure, and of course we've heard that a lot, mm -hmm. um, do you mean people aren't sure where their next food is going to come from or if they are going to have enough? That's right, yes. So people typically um, dip in and out of food security at different times of the month. I explained about, you know, kind of later in the month. And then sometimes people will be food secure for a period of time and then not again. So our goal is to get to a place of food security that is not dependent on us and, uh, and emergency gotcha. organizations giving food. So if, uh, you know, an older adult comes to me and says, you know, oh, don't worry, I'm food secure because I go to this pantry on that day, that pantry on another day, that's not really food security. Yeah. So that's why we're really focused on building up this region as a place that, you know, first of all, it generates a lot of food, but also that we want to support food-based businesses that allow more and more food to be created here. And ultimately, our dream is to build a kitchen of our own where we can utilize some of the food that we have that's leftover food or donated food to create healthy meals that we can then distribute to older adults and others in the community. Gotcha. Because, you know, we've had a program called Brown Bag, which is our mm -hmm. senior uh, food program for years. And, you know, it can be a struggle for older adults to deal with a lot of cans or dried beans or things like that. People don't feel like cooking a lot. What they want is a, a simple, healthy meal that's virtually ready to go. Yeah. Whether it's something frozen that they can put in their microwave or something that's salad-based or fresh. So our focus is really to move in that direction mm -hmm. so that we're giving people the food that they need and want. Not back in the bad old days where we're giving you whatever junk the food industry is, is trying to get rid of. Yeah. Uh, you know, at one point in history, food banks were full of blue coke. Remember when Blue Coke was something that <laughs> yes. they, they tried to foist upon us, and then when they discovered that the great American public did not like Blue Coke, suddenly food banks were awash with this uh, Gosh. stuff. Gosh. Yeah. So. so tell me about um, how was the food bank impacted by the COVID pandemic? Sure. I mean, COVID was an amazing experience for those of us within the food bank. Um, suddenly, the demand for our services doubled, you know, virtually overnight uh, in terms of poundage and in terms of the number of people that we serve. So typically we are distributing around 10 or 11 million pounds of food around the county every year. That went up to 22, 23, 
Um, and it's really, we're still at a stage now of 50% more than normal. Mm. Uh, but during COVID, we had to totally rethink the way in which we, we did things. Because if you can think about it, food banks, um, their model is to bring a bunch of food to one place and then have everyone come to that place. And mm -hmm. we know that during COVID, that was probably not the best model uh, yeah. to get everyone together like that. So we had to develop our muscle in terms of distributing to more uh, individual peoples in their homes and, and to work in a different way. Luckily, during COVID, we had uh, up to about 47 National Guards uh, people who were helping us, and that made a huge difference. We had to open two new warehouses on top of our existing two in Santa Maria and Santa Barbara. Um, and we had to do a lot more drive-through pantries, you know, mm. where people come in their cars, we put the food in the back and oh, they drive sure. off. Yeah. yeah. So those continue, those type of pantries. Uh, and we've seen a lot of issues with people being affected by inflation. Um, you know, things that are, have gone up significantly are things like gas and food. And those are things that lower income people spend a disproportionate amount yeah. of their salary on. And so inflation has really impacted a lot of people that we work with significantly and meant that they need more help. Wow. And so the food bank is a nonprofit and you accept tax deductible donations, I mm -hmm. would imagine. We do, we do. A person could probably go on your website and find a donate now button. Absolutely, yes. And you know, we have this ability, uh, you know, we can turn a dollar often into seven dollars in terms of what we're purchasing because we get together with other food banks, we mm -hmm. buy things cheaply. Um, so providing funds for us to do that is really a very you know, intelligent way of doing it. But you know, money is just half the story, right? We, as I've talked about with our, um, our educational programs, mm -hmm. you know, we really need the community to be uh, you know, connected closely to us. And I'm glad to say that you know, we have about 700, 800 volunteers who work really? with us. Yeah whether they're teaching in a program, helping in the warehouse, delivering. And one of the most exciting new groups of volunteers for me is our, what are called our CERT um, trainees. So CERT stands for a Community Emergency Response Team. Mm -hmm. um, our local offices of emergency management had, had run various training courses. These are for community people to be able to help in a disaster. So we actually have an embedded disaster manager within the food bank. So we've been doing our own CERT training of our volunteers and our staff, but also training them how to operate pantries and to, to do that work in the event of a disaster. Because during COVID, you know, a lot of nonprofits discovered that their traditional volunteers were staying at home. You know, they did not want yeah. to get infected. They were an older population. So this is allowing us to really build the food bank's muscle so that if there is a significant earthquake, whatever, then we can respond mm -hmm. very quickly. That's so smart. And so once again, a person mm -hmm. can go on the website and find out how to be a volunteer, what kinds of things you need. Yeah, I mean, both North and South County, we have individual people who can work with you to find out the type of things that you like doing and see whether there's a fit there for something you could do at the food bank. And we really have some incredible, dedicated volunteers who have been with us for a really long time. Wow. And so um, we have just a couple of minutes left. And so I'd love to hear about the books that you have written for children um, about good choices of food and, and yeah. all that. So yes, I've written a series of three books. Uh, and the series is called Food Justice Books for Kids. Um, and there are three books, one called Lulu and the Hunger Monster, that looks at food and uh, insecurity and hunger in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So a, a girl called Lulu has this invisible monster, the hunger monster, who's you know, bugging her and um, saying, you can't tell anyone about me, because often hunger is something that mm. kids want to keep secret. So this is a positive book that helps kids who are food insecure, but also others to think of empathetic ways that they can help and things that they can do. The two other books, one of them, uh, Jesse and the uh, Snack Food Genie, looks at healthy eating, how kids can really work with their, and cook with their families more. Yeah. And then the final one is uh, Frankie versus the Food Phantom, which looks at the entire food system and how kids can in get involved in the food system by growing some of their own food. So these are for seven to 10 year old kids, they're picture books. Um, and they really get great conversations going in classrooms. So have you written other books or other things before? Or you just said, oh, one day you just said, hey, I think I'm going to 
write a book for kids? Uh, well, I have a background as a writer, as a playwright, oh, and a filmmaker, and I've written other books for kids. Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. And so you just thought this would be a good um, Yeah, you, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of families and had experience, and so I really wanted to be able to speak to kids in a way that was not patronizing and was supportive and yeah. allow them to kind of think through some of these food issues and make them more food literate. That's wonderful. Sounds like you've thought of everything, Eric. I have not thought of everything. <laughs> There's um, more to come, yeah, I'm absolutely. sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we're just getting started. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all of your important work and for coming on our show to share it with our audience. Thank you so much for inviting me, Cinder. And thank you for joining us on 805 Focus, and we'll see you next time.